Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Movies You're Going to Learn From, where George Kaysen and me get together and review, review movies that are good enough to learn from. And we care about learning, and movies are a great way to do that. And today, we're going to do Operation Mincemeat, which is a very educational movie on many levels. George, tell us about the circumstances of this movie. This is a real movie, a movie based on real events, World War II. British naval intelligence was able to think up this plot to fool the Nazi regime into believing that Allied naval forces were going to be initially landing in Greece as opposed to the truth that was Sicily. And they concocted this, this unbelievably complicated scenario where they were going to find a body, and they found the body of a homeless man that had died. He had swallowed rat poison because he was eating bread that had been smeared with rat poison. Uh, so basically, they found this body, and they were able to make him into a fictitious Navy officer a name by the name of Martin, right? Something Martin, right? And and they they were going to take him, put a correspondence on him in, in this bag and in his personal letters, right? And then dump him off the Gulf of Cadiz in Spain, which as we've talked in other uh, reviews, there was a connection with the Nazis in Spain, you know, the Spanish under Franco. So they were, they did this, but there was a lot of things that could have gone wrong. It was a complicated, uh, you know, operation. And they did, were able to get this guy thrown in the water, right, from a submarine, right? And they were able to fool the Nazi regime. And we didn't know until the end of this movie, you know, what had really, that they were successful, even though it was a true story, right? And because of this, the Allied forces got into Sicily, had very little opposition, right? And were able eventually to take Italy, which turned the tide of the war. So this was critical. And there were the two naval officers, Edwin Montagu and what was the other guy? Yeah, the, the two naval officers had thought this thing up using another plan from 1939. I forgot the name of it. You know, that, that to fool the enemy. And this is basically what this whole movie is about. And then you get into personal romantic things and Evan uh, Montague, his wife was sent to, because uh, he was partially of Jewish uh, heritage, and and he sent his wife to America because they were afraid the Nazis may take England. And then he had a love affair with his secretary, you know. Uh, so they, that, they got into side things like that. And then the other guy, um, he was also in love with, the sec with Montague's secretary. So these are all side stories. The key points here is fooling the enemy, winning the war. This was this was the actual turning point. Otherwise, Hitler and his Nazis would continue taking over. So that's the basics. Okay, let me add some thoughts on that. Surely. Yeah, the, the, the Nazis firmly believed that the attack, um, was the assault, was going to be in Sicily. And they knew it. These intelligence guys knew it, and their job was to redirect the Nazis to Greece, and uh, they hadn't figured out a way to do it. And uh, there were some very poignant moments on that. You know, they, you know, they they gave you the what do you want to call it the the uh, the, the difficulty of dealing with the bureaucracy and the and the Royal Navy. Uh, it was hard to get an unusual plan by them. It was hard to do something creative in the Royal Navy. Um, but they did, and they got, ultimately, they got it up to Churchill. Churchill, remarkable statement he made. He said, this is very unlikely to succeed. When can you start? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's Churchill. Because he understood that you have to fake them out. And one of the statements they made in this movie was, um, you know, war um, 
leads to strange circumstances. Uh, and indeed, this is an example of that. The war is truth wrapped in lies. That's intelligence. That is how you fake out Hitler. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, the, they came up with this plan. It was unlikely to succeed, and it, it required all kinds of luck. Uh, for example, the dead body they had was a guy uh, who, even, I think he was a street person, a drunk, homeless. And, and um, you know, anybody making an autopsy of him would have found that he did not die from drowning which was the cover story, that he, that he would have died from, you know, toxic alcohol. Um, but what happened is they get into the autopsy room in Spain, in Barcelona, I think, um, and he's been dead for months. And when the um, very expert autopsy surgeon um, started to open him up, the stink was unbearable. And they, all these guys in the room said, we can't hang around for this. Let's just write it down as a drowning, okay? But, you know, truth is, uh, that, that doctor could easily have found that it was not a drowning. They said they couldn't, none of them could stand the smell. Now, there were all kinds of close calls like that. And the other, the other thing that I thought was really interesting, I don't know if you thought this, is that it was, there was a mistake somewhere in the phony papers they made. It was something not logical about the way they presented this, this corpse and about these um, papers suggesting that the, uh, you know, the invasion was going to be in Greece. But the intelligence guy and the Nazi side of it, he wasn't crazy about it. And uh, there was a suggestion that he was part of the cabal that was trying to assassinate Hitler. Nobody knew that. But he, 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 he got these papers and he had to make the decision about whether to believe them or not believe them. And he knew in, in you know, logic on it that he really shouldn't believe them. But because he didn't like Hitler, um, he decided he would believe them. And he redirected the uh, Nazi defense force to Greece which was also a stroke of incredible luck because it could have gone the other way just as easy. And if it had gone the other way, the Nazis would have been waiting for the invasion force and they would have shot up 100,000 Brits and Americans. So mm, this was really a cliffhanger. You did, as you said, George, you didn't know until you really got down to the end about whether the luck, the joss, would work in their favor or not. Uh, it was very creative. It was really heady stuff. And it was, I hate to say fun, but it was a great intellectual challenge for them to come up with it, at least a plausible scam like this. And by George, sometimes plausible scams work. And um, that's, that's what happened here. In terms of my reaction, go ahead. Really lucky. And then there was, a, they, they also discussed the actual battles and then what's going on behind the scenes were what you just alluded to the the the, the, the espionage the intelligence the fooling the you know presenting things that are not true so they're the two ways of fighting a war yeah just as you alluded to yep yeah. so yeah that's that was interesting yeah yeah and then one subplot that uh, you didn't mention is that um the character um was his name ewan i guess um was a tremendous character. Colin Firth played that. Brit played that role right, Colin Firth. Yeah, and the, and the secretary in their intelligence unit, Kelly McDonald. Kelly Kelly McDonald, who I think is one of the best actresses on the on the stage on screen right now. She's really terrific. She's she's from Scotland, you know. She has a Scotch brogue. I love that. Anyway, <laughs> and they made her up. She didn't look like herself the way that they made her up on the movie. She looked very darker hair and. They had makeup on her that made her look quite different. Than her. Well, they they took you there. They took you to 1943, which is when all this happened, and uh, over a period of, of six months or so, and and um, they looked like they were in 1943. They all licked and acted and spoke, and you. That's one of the reasons I liked the movie is that there was a certain authenticity about it. But the subplot I wanted to mention is that Colin Firth, our hero, had a brother 
who in fact was uh, he was a spy of some some kind, and the Brits were very concerned that he would know find out about what Colin was doing, and report, and um, they were they were very concerned about that, and they were they were uh, watching Colin's character to be sure that that didn't happen, and they were ready to take dramatic action like killing people uh, if they found that the brother. Uh, who was not particularly responsible, uh, the brother who lived with Colin, uh, uh, if the brother revealed anything. So it was it was the whole thing about secrecy, about planning things, deceiving the other side, even deceiving the people on your side, so that nobody knows what's really coming down. And, um, you know, it, it, it took me back to the whole thing about World War II. It was a lot less sophisticated than what we do now. Espionage then was a lot less sophisticated, but the stakes were very high. You know, and I and I think of the um, you know Trump and Neuralago and national security and secrets, secrets that affect national security. And I think of you know the president of the United States doesn't seri- take it seriously. There was an article a few days ago about how he used classified documents to write his to-do lists. I mean, really. You know, and, and I think, you know, a lot of people in this country have no idea um, about keeping things secret, you know, state secrets, national secrets, secret. And, and, and they don't realize that th- those secrets can make it or break it for you. And that was one of the messages of this movie. You had to keep it secret because otherwise hundreds of thousands of people would die on your watch because of what you did or didn't do because you kept your lips, you know, you know, what do they say? Loose lips or or not. So that that's one of the great messages of this movie. In terms of the um, the quality of the movie, the acting, Colin Firth is really good. And I said Kelly McDonald, really good. All the players, really good. And the way they, they set up the historical circumstances and venues and um, well, all, of, all of the things that took place it was really as faithful as you could imagine the way things happened in 1943. I felt I was being transported there. Really well done. The scenery was good. You know, the, uh, the acting, as you said, was, was superb. Colin Firth and, and Ch- Kelly McDonald and he, all the others. And I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to say. I, you know, movies you can learn from. Where are we in today? We've got Putin in Russia who wants to be the, the next uh, Peter the Great, span Russian. You know, he wants to, that's that's his main objective, long-term objective. That's everything he's doing that. And as you know, my view of Aaron Erdogan wants to be Fatih the Conqueror again. He wants to expand the Neo-Ottoman Empire. So you've got these players and a few others, you know, you've got the theocracy in Iran and uh, Af- Afghanistan with the Taliban, right? And then you have Trump's people that are, they want theocracy here too, you know, that that's part of his, the whole agenda, right? So you've got all these problems around the world. And I don't think unless you all of Europe and America gets behind Ukraine and fights, you know, how are you, how are you going to turn Putin, you know, arrest his his taking of all that land in Ukraine? I don't think this is a stopgap. So you look at the movie we just we saw we were reviewing how unity brought you know Hitler and the Nazis down. So you, if you want to look at the current, how, how do you parlay that view of how things were handled? to the present day when we have multiple issues around the world. And you brought up Trump, but there's a lot of other issues. You know, so, I mean, I look at the Ukrainian situation and unless we actually, we and the Europeans get behind actual battles, I don't see Ukraine on their own being able to throw off the Russian yoke completely. So that's my view of things. Well, I've been thinking a lot about that, George, and you are absolutely right. 
Um, Ukraine needs the United States. It needs support. It needs money. It needs weapons from the United States. And we are so casual. And Joe Biden is so casual, um, you know, and so chicken, if you will, about providing the aircraft and missiles and whatever else they need. And if they don't prevail, if they if they lose to the Russians, it isn't going to be a pretty picture in this country because Trump will attack Biden the way he attacked him after the failure in the departure of Afghanistan. Wrongly. He attacked him wrongly, but there will be a lot of people who will write Biden off if the Ukrainians do not prevail. And just because Biden has said, I will help them, except he hasn't helped them that much. I, I would like to see us help them a lot. The other thing, going back to uh, Churchill, when Churchill said, I don't, I don't, this is an unlikely success, but let's do it. Um, then you had a small example of Churchill's leadership. And the way you said the Brits were unified in this war, they were. It wasn't just that there were, you know, bombs falling on them and rockets falling on them from the Germans that, that galvanized them. No, it was Churchill. He was a brilliant wartime leader. Brilliant. And he knew how to get people together. He knew what to say, how to say it, where and when to say it. And he got people all together. And as a result, um, the British people, you know, never lost focus. Unfortunately, in the United States and for that matter, Europe, it's so easy uh, for us to lose focus. And we are losing focus. Every day we're losing focus. This is visible in the world. So the lesson, you know, of, of that movie is you've got to stay focused. You've got to have a focused and strong um, leader like Churchill, so, and, and uh, you know, who will lead you through difficult times and keep you together, and who will not, you know, not, not leave the goal, not leave the mission. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, and that is going to hurt Ukraine, but ultimately it's going to hurt us. So if, if anybody's listening, I would say the lesson here is we better stay together on this issue. We cannot afford all the nonsense that's going on in Congress with the Republicans and, and the Freedom Caucus and the right-wing conservatives. That is so disruptive to the world order. And it is so, it is so permissive of, of fascism, so permissive of autocracy. Uh, that it is um, it is a recipe for a disaster. We had better look back, look at this movie, and learn from it. Precisely, you know, even with this Iranian deal they made, you know, six billion dollars. It's supposed to be for humanitarian purposes, but then, you know, you don't know if that's gonna it's gonna stick, you know. And then and then um, already another hostage has been taken from from the West. Uh, so, you know. I got problems, as I've said before, with Joe Biden's foreign policy, as you said, not forceful enough, you know? I mean, I mean, Trump, Trump's BS, you know, what he did, you know, with the uh, uh, Abraham Accords, but he should, I mean, I'm a, left, I'm a leftist kind of guy, but, but they wouldn't if Bolton, he had let Bolton do that, what, he, what Bolton wanted to do and get rid of that regime, you know, in Iran, uh, we're dealing with that too. We're dealing with that regime in Iran. We're dealing with Putin. We're dealing er Erdogan, right? Expansionist. So, a little more firmness, you know. I mean, I never liked Reagan politically, but he was a firm guy, you know. He he got up and he said something about a Berlin Wall, you know, to uh, take down this wall. So we, you know, there's problems right now with our government you know, facing these things and, and what's going to happen in Iran, in, I mean, in, in, in Ukraine, yeah? So this movie, as you said, is really gives a, a picture. And one of the problems I had with this movie is the guy who played Churchill, I didn't really think he was playing that role to a T. I had problems with the way he was playing Churchill because I've seen, you know, videos of Churchill I, it sort of didn't quite hit the mark. It wasn't forceful enough. It was something. Something was missing in that in that presentation of of Churchill. So that that was one of the things. It didn't show the forcefulness or the 
the the just who who Churchill was and how he projected himself. So that that that's why I may not give this a ten. But other than that, the lessons, movies you can learn from of this movie are phenomenal. Unity in unity there is strength, and you've got to have people who are smart who can think out of the box, like Edwin Montague and the other guy. They thought out of the box, right? And they were able to literally save hundreds and thousands of allied lives by doing this. And this war would have dragged on and we might not even have won it. I mean, the Axis may have won, you know? So key point. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, on that, you know, every day is a turning point in a war like this. And for that matter, every day is a turning point in the civil war we're having in this country. And every day is a turning point in the Ukraine war uh, we're having in Eastern Europe. But I wanted to offer another thought to you, George, and that's this. We had a show earlier today where we, we talked about the, the platform, the, the vision, if you will, of the Democratic Party, um, both nationally and locally, for that matter. Um, and um, one of the speakers who I thought was inspired said, uh, you know, the question put to them was, what can we do to activate um, you know, the Democratic Party so that we are more likely to follow them. Uh, so that they are more likely to, you know, to, to provide the energy, the rhetoric to invigorate, you know, the public because they're losing it. And um, you know, a lot of stuff been written about that. And, and the, um, the, the, the speaker on the, on the program said, make movies. We have to make movies. We have to make movies about what's happening. You know, the storm and the drawing of the individual citizen and how this is all so crazy in Washington. We're really not covering it. Now, now uh, the front line on PBS, they make some pretty good movies, um, but we need much more of that. We need to, uh, you know, explore this, examine this in detail. We need movie makers to show us what's going on, um, not only here in this country, but elsewhere in the world. Um, and of course, in Eastern Europe, we're not doing that. I mean, we see the news, but the news is always so, you know, ad hoc. Let's let's see a careful examination of these things so people understand the world in which we live and the world in which we will live if if these inflection points go wrong, if we don't have the luck to prevail on our hopes. So it, it, it strikes me that this movie, Operation Mincemeat, was an example of a movie about an event, a series of events and characters, a series of strategies and successes and luck um, in 1943. But, you know, behind, behind the movie makers, the writers, the producers, the actors, the conceptualizers of this movie, there is also the thought that they are affirmatively trying to teach us something about our world today, about the the need for secrecy, the need for strategy, for creativity, um, you know, the need to, 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 to win and to have unified, you know, public opinion about it and to have a guy like Churchill who could bring people, a whole country together. See, and, and so it strikes me that this movie, um, the Mincemeat movie, uh, is an example of a movie where you pretty much could assume that the movie makers are trying to, they're trying to give you that message. They're trying to show you that. They're trying to affect your opinion and public opinion. So the, the, the speaker on our program this morning, you know, is really saying we, we need more movies like this. We have to teach people so it sticks. We have to cover these things where people are confused and where there are those like Trump that would like to confuse them. We have to clarify it. So Miss Me is an example of that, I think. And there are others, too. There are other important movie makers and actors, producers, directors. I'm sorry they're having this strike. I'm really sorry, because this is the time they should be writing and directing and producing those movies. But they're busy with the strike. That's right. My, my right God. now, those movies could be a real problem solver. We could clarify what is going on for millions, tens of millions of Americans, but we're not having them. Um, so I think that's one of the lessons I take from this mixed meat movie. Yeah, my cousin's a 
expiring actor and he's been standing on the on the striking, you know. But one of the things you said that really is profound, not too many people, like, you know, I read everything. I'm alert on taking New York Times, Washington Post, Economist. I read constantly. But most of the public is, you know, and I'm sort of semi-retired, so I got a little more time on my hands and my ex, no kids. She didn't want kids. So bottom line is, I have the time, but most of the public, they don't have the time. These movies are really the way to teach them because they don't get on all these news shows. They don't look behind the, you know, that's why Trump is so powerful. He is, it seems that his constituency is not really highly educated. It's the people who don't have that much education and they follow him. So these movies will actually teach the public. They don't have to read all these different newspapers and and reports. They just have to watch the movie to get a perception of what's going on. So right on key on, Jay, you said you you hit the bullseye. I worry that one day um, the Trumpers are going to realize that they too can make movies and they'll make false movies. They do. lie to us and they will lie to the base about these movies and they will bring people over to their side of public opinion and it'll be too late for the Democrats. This is a this is a five alarm fire. We've said that before and we meant it before. Now we mean it more. That you know the country has to wake up on this or else. And that's one of the problems in the Democratic platform. You know, that you could read and read until you're you know you're you're sleeping. You'll be sleeping. No. I get on Fox News and Town Hall. I want to understand where those I don't agree with are coming from. And there's already movies being made, you know, um, not to that amount, but there are movies being made in Trump's vision. And people watch these movies, you know. I mean, it's it's like sort of under under you know, it's not in the mainstream, but there are and 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 some of these crazy conspiracy theories, there's there's people putting out. We have the internet now, and and you know you can, you can have your own blog and say things that are totally totally untrue. You know, I mean us Armenians, we love Adam Schiff. You know, they're really painting him as a horrible horrible man. And Trump just got on said said all kind of things about him. And Trump is like a kid. He's like he hasn't really changed his logo since he was in eighth grade. And that's the kind of things he calls this one a shitty, this one's a, a you know, he's got names, <laughs> junior high school names for everybody. And there's pe- there's people in our country who just eat this up. So, you know, you know, there are movies that are projecting his view of things. I mean, it just came out that some, I think CBS poll says that Trump is going to win by one point. Of course, that changes it. There's always four or five percent that could be off. But the fact that there's a 50-50 kind of thing here is very worrisome that this man who's being arrested, you know, January 6th stuff, you know, and I mean, there are, there were Republicans that were more honorable. I mean, I did agree with some of their viewpoints, but like uh, Romney and, and uh, you know, Huntsman Jr., because as an Armenian, you know, American, I we like the Huntsmans. But I mean, they were honorable people. Trump is not honorable. And they're at 50. 70% of Republicans are supporting him, even be with his arrests. So what does that say about our populace? What is well, it? what it says is that they have no idea what, what Hitler was doing to people. They have no idea what Stalin was doing to people. In fact, you know, you have your, your kids tell on you. Um, you have people tell on their friends and co-workers and family. You break down civil society in every way you can. I don't know if you remember, George, that we reviewed All Quiet on the Western Front. That's a movie that Hitler didn't like. So he got Goebbels, at the, Goebbels was his PR guy, as I recall, um, to, to, to stop that movie. It was playing in Germany in the, I guess, the early 20s uh, or maybe the late 20s. And uh, what he did was he let, he let a bunch of rats loose in the theater where it was premiering. Um, And then he did something else to scare people and force out of the theater. And and they got the message and the movie failed in Germany. Um, So Hitler got what he wanted. He was going to discourage a movie, any, you know, public expression 
of the fact that war is no good, of, of the First World War was no good, that many, many Germans were killed. Um, and he was, he was going to, you know, affect public opinion that way. I suggest to you that that could happen again, which is, um, you know, one reason why movies uh, like Operation Mincemeat are important. It's not that they directly address what Trump is doing, what Hitler did, I mean, to Germany, um, what Stalin did, what Putin is doing now. It's that they just give you one truth, one philosophical approach, and you start building your world view around that. That's what the movie maker intends. He's not going to, you know, make a speech about everything that happened to me. It's too big a target. But if he says, look, national security is really important and keeping, you know, national secrets is really important um, and winning together is really important, then he's, he's teaching you lessons that seem to relate to 1943, but in fact relate to 2023. Exactly. And it's a little piece here and a little piece there, and Hollywood can do a lot to re-educate people about what it means to live in a democracy, a fragile democracy. Because Trumpism, a lot of it's like Goebbels, you know, but all his lies and he tried to change the truth, you know, about January 6th, what, what, you know, it's all, law, I mean, everything's, he's, he's been known to be untruthful for many decades. I mean, this is nothing new with him, you know, and his businesses were a lot of them were built on untruths, you know, and then he would go to court with, you know, countersue everything. And, and so, yeah, you know, you, we, this movie, as you said, subtly talks about lessons for today domestically as well as uh, foreign policy. You know, what's what's going on within our own nation with fake news, you know? And Trump is the key, key player with fake news. And um, I don't know. I, I think that, as you said, movies will help because public's not not researching under the, under the, I mean, you and I, I know we're alert, you know? They're not alert. They just go along with the flow until it's too late. And then once they lose their rights, you know, it, it can slip away. I mean, my dad was in 1923. He was in Weimar, Germany. You know, they, they sent him to school. They had paid in advance. They had to stay there till he graduated in school. They didn't pay. They had no money anymore. But, but, but then that, how that turned so quickly, you know, with the Hitler and the Nazis, that could happen here too. And, yeah, we're right. There's a five alarm fire, and I don't know why the Democrats don't rise to the occasion. They don't, and I don't know why Hollywood is out there, you know, protesting and, um, you know, trying to squeeze more money out of the movie studios uh, at a time when we really need to hear from them. We need to hear their best work. They have to get back, and they have to start making the movies we need to straighten out the country. Uh, subtly, one issue at a time. But, um, you know, to be uh, striking and protesting and walking the pavement with their signs at this point in time um, just seems to be the wrong thing. They are a very important force. And like our speaker this morning said, we need to make movies. This is a British movie, you know. Um, I wish there were a lot of American movies that did the same thing. Citizens United has changed the whole complexion of what goes on politically, right? Even the Democrats, I mean, you know, I have an electric car because I don't think we should be beholden to all the oil oil uh, countries, right, of the world. Uh, but but uh, Democrats are not really fighting too, too powerfully. I mean, they did that thing in Alaska, you know, Biden said that they, they can't drill in Alaska. But the oil companies have a lot of power, you know, and, and uh, and Democrats are sort of going soft. Biden was, they're going soft on a lot of this stuff because there's a big election coming up and they don't want to, they, they don't want to get these uh, big corporations on their, on the wrong side. So realize that the winning ticket is to be strong 
and yes. to say what you mean and mean what you say, and I exercise leadership, the kind of leadership that Churchill had. And uh, that, you know, if, if they are compromising everything, they're going to lose. That's the problem that I've had with as much as I worked my behind off for Obama to get him elected the first time around. And even Biden, I worked to get him elected. It's the softness that's bothering. It's the wishy-washiness. You know, they, they've got to be more strong. And, and as I said, Citizens United has sort of made them a little afraid that they don't want all these all this big money working against them. But, you know, and you said those movies that, I mean, the public, I mean, it's like, what is the public being fed that's, that's, that's distorting their thinking, the thinking that it's not going to impact them if we have a, a theocracy? Exactly. They don't understand. They think it, whatever happens politically is somebody else's problem and it, it won't affect them. I'm here to tell you, it will affect them in every way. Precisely. I mean, those of us, I mean, who have had family in, in autocratic countries with it, with genocide or massacres or whatever is the final, you know, kind of thing. I mean, I don't know if, if they really understand where we're headed. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's incomprehensible to me how they just don't see it. They, it's like myopia. They don't see what's happening. But when Donald Trump gets up and with his silly baby stuff, right? But they don't understand what's go what's going on. And I'm really unhappy with my Democratic Party for, as you said, the mushiness. There's there's no fun. Look at Churchill. I mean, he. That's why I said I, I didn't like the, the way the guy played. Churchill was such a powerful figure, you know. I think it's amazing guy, right? And and and. For all his faults, Roosevelt was, I mean, I have major problems with him in the Holocaust, but but he was forceful too. He was the guy in a wheelchair, you know? He sort of unified the country in whatever way, right? So you know, that's the bottom line. Well, you'll, you'll do a little cutting out, but I give this a nine because I have problems. The, the idea, I love the, 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 the idea. It was a real rule about a real, real situation and brilliant, brilliant thinking. Of course, there was, like you said, a lot of luck. This could have gone really wrong, and it would have prolonged the war, and more people would have died. But with a little bit of luck, it worked, and they were able to get Italy to fall, and then eventually Nazi, Nazis. I don't know how you can parlay this into the Ukrainian situation right now. That's the key thing, you know, that that's playing into everything and how, how we work it from there. You take care, Jay. Uh, how do you feel about this? What was your rating before we vote? I, I'd give it a 10. Okay. I, I agree that uh, Churchill was, did not meet my, yeah. info, uh, my, my view of him, my expectations. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I saw this as a statement of British um, history, uh, an iconic event that took place. It was, you know, classified for a long time after we, nobody knew about it. Um, and it is a statement of how the British nerve and spirit and creativity, uh, the whole British thing succeeded. And what does that tell you? It tells you to be patriotic. It tells you to be together. Um, it tells you that this is a great country. And um, I think that statement was very important uh, for the movie, to make the movie a 10. But it's also very important for the British to see that now, to see that in terms of um, dealing with Ukraine and dealing with all the other issues that it has, it has a lot of issues. And so I think we can learn from the fact that they took an iconic moment and made it into a heart-rending, patriotic moment. That's why I give it a 10. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, George. We'll take it from here. All right. Talk soon. Aloha. Aloha.